Chapter 9 of A Journey into the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne, translated by Frederick Mallison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Iceland, but what next? The day for our departure arrived. The day before it, our kind friend Monsieur Thompson brought us letters of introduction to Count Trampa, the governor of Iceland, Monsieur Picterson, the bishop suffragan, and Monsieur Finson, mayor of Reykjavik. My uncle expressed his gratitude by tremendous compressions of both his hands. On the second, at six in the evening, all our precious baggage being safely on board the Valkyria, the captain took us into a very narrow cabin. "'Is the wind favourable?' my uncle asked. "'Excellent,' replied Captain Bjarna. "'A south-easter. We shall pass down the sound full speed, with all sails set.' In a few minutes the schooner, under her mizzen, brigantine, topsail, and top-gallant sail, loosed from her moorings and made full sail through the straits. In an hour the captain of Denmark seemed to sink below the distant waves, and the Valkyria was skirting the coast by Elsinore. In my nervous frame of mind I expected to see the ghost of Hamlet wandering on the legendary castle terrace. "'Sublime madman,' I said, "'no doubt you would approve of our expedition. Perhaps you would keep us company to the centre of the globe, to find the solution of your eternal doubts.' But there was no ghostly shape upon the ancient walls. Indeed, the castle is much younger than the heroic prince of Denmark. It now answers the purpose of a sumptuous lodge for the doorkeeper of the Straits of the Sound, before which every year there pass fifteen thousand ships of all nations. The castle of Kronsberg soon disappeared in the mist, as well as the tower of Helsingborg, built on the Swedish coast, and the schooner passed lightly on her way, urged by the breezes of the Kattegat. The Valkyrie was a splendid sailor, but on a sailing vessel you can place no dependence. She was taking to Reykjavik coal, household goods, earthenware, woolen clothing, and a cargo of wheat. The crew consisted of five men, all Danes. "'How long would the passage take?' my uncle asked. Ten days,' the captain replied, "'if we don't meet a Nor'wester in passing the Pharaohs.' "'But are you not subject to considerable delays?' "'No, Monsieur Liedenbrock, don't be uneasy. We shall get there in very good time." At evening the schooner doubled the skaw at the northern point of Denmark, in the night passed the Skager Rack, skirted Norway by Cape Lindness, and entered the North Sea. In two days more we sighted the coast of Scotland near Peterhead, and the Valkyria turned her lead towards the Faroe Islands, passing between the Orkneys and Shetlands. Soon the schooner encountered the great Atlantic swell. She had to tack against the north wind, and reached the Pharaohs only with some difficulty. On the eighth, the captain made out Meganus, the southernmost of these islands, and from that moment took a straight course for Cape Portland, the most southerly point of Iceland. The passage was marked by nothing unusual. I bore the troubles of the sea pretty well. My uncle, to his own intense disgust, and his greater shame, was ill all through the voyage. He therefore was unable to converse with the captain about Snaffel, the way to get to it, the facilities for transport. He was obliged to put off these inquiries until his arrival, and spent all his time at full length in his cabin, of which the timbers creaked and shook with every pitch he took. It must be confessed he was not undeserving of his punishment. On the eleventh we reached Cape Portland. The clear open weather gave us a good view of Myrtle's yokel, which overhangs it. The cape is merely a low hill with steep sides, standing lonely by the beach. The Valkyria kept at some distance from the coast, taking a westerly course amidst great shoals of whales and sharks. Soon we came in sight of an enormous perforated rock, through which the sea dashed furiously. The Westman Islet seemed to rise out of the ocean like a group of rocks in a liquid plain. From that time the schooner took a wide berth and swept at a great distance round Cape Reykjanes, which forms the western point of Iceland. The rough sea prevented my uncle from coming on deck to admire these shattered and surf-beaten coasts. 
Forty-eight hours after, coming out of a storm which forced the schooner to scud under bare poles, we sighted east of us the beacon on Cape Scoggin, where dangerous rocks extended far away seaward. An Icelandic pilot came on board, and in three hours the Valkyria dropped her anchor before Reykjavik in Foxa Bay. The professor at last emerged from his cabin, rather pale and wretched-looking, but still full of enthusiasm, and with ardent satisfaction shining in his eyes. The population of the town, wonderfully interested in the arrival of a vessel from which every one expected something, formed in groups upon the quay. My uncle left in haste his floating prison, or rather hospital. But before quitting the deck of the schooner he dragged me forward, and, pointing with outstretched finger north of the bay at a distant mountain terminating in a double peak, a pair of cones covered with perpetual snow, he cried, Snuffel! Snuffel! Then, recommending me, by an impressive gesture, to keep silence, he went into the boat which awaited him. I followed, and presently we were treading the soil of Iceland. The first man we saw was a good-looking fellow enough in a general's uniform. Yet he was not a general, but a magistrate, the governor of the island, Monsieur Le Baron Trampa himself. The professor was soon aware of the presence he was in. He delivered him his letters from Copenhagen, and then followed a short conversation in the Danish language, the purport of which I was quite ignorant of, and for a very good reason. But the result of this first conversation was that Baron Trampa placed himself entirely at the service of Professor Liedenbrock. My uncle was just as courteously received by the mayor, M. Finson, whose appearance was as military and disposition and office as pacific as the governor's. As for the bishop's suffragan, M. Picterson, he was at that moment engaged on an episcopal visitation in the north. For the time we must be resigned to wait for the honor of being presented to him. But M. Fridrikson, professor of natural sciences at the school of Reykjavik, was a delightful man and his friendship became very precious to me. This modest philosopher spoke only Danish and Latin. He came to proffer me his good offices in the language of Horace, and I felt that we were made to understand each other. In fact, he was the only person in Iceland with whom I could converse at all. This good-natured gentleman made over to us two of the three rooms which his house contained, and we were soon installed in it with all our luggage, the abundance of which rather astonished the good people of Reykjavik. "'Well, Axel,' said my uncle, "'we are getting on, and now the worst is over.' "'The worst?' I said, astonished. "'To be sure. Now we have nothing to do but go down.' "'Oh, if that is all, you are quite right. But, after all, when we have gone down, we shall have to get up again, I suppose. Oh, I don't trouble myself about that. Come, there's no time to lose. I am going to the library. Perhaps there is some manuscript of Sagnusum's there, and I should be glad to consult it. Well, while you are there, I will go into the town. Won't you? Oh, that is very uninteresting to me. It is not what is upon this island, but what is underneath that interests me. I went out and wandered wherever chance took me. It would not be easy to lose your way in Reykjavik. I was therefore under no necessity to inquire the road, which exposes one to mistakes when the only medium of intercourse is gesture. The town extends along a low and marshy level, between two hills. An immense bed of lava bounds it on one side, and falls gently towards the sea. On the other extends the vast bay of Faxa, shut in at the north by the enormous glacier of the Snaffel, and of which the Valkyria was for the time the only occupant. Usually the English and French conservators of fisheries moor in this bay, but just then they were cruising about the western coasts of the island. The longest of the only two streets that Reykjavik possesses was parallel with the beach. Here lived the merchants and traders, in wooden cabins made of red planks set horizontally. The other street, running west, ends at the little lake between the house of the bishop and other non-commercial people. I had soon explored these melancholy ways. Here and there I got a glimpse of faded turf, looking like a worn-out bit of carpet, or some appearance of kitchen-garden, 
the sparse vegetables of which, potatoes, cabbages, and lettuces, would have figured appropriately upon a Lilliputian table. A few sickly wallflowers were trying to enjoy the air and sunshine. About the middle of the tin commercial street I found the public cemetery, enclosed in a mud wall, and where there seemed plenty of room. Then a few steps brought me to the governor's house, a butt compared with the town of Hamburg, a palace in comparison with the cabins of the Icelandic population. Between the little lake and the town the church is built in the Protestant style, of calcined stones extracted out of the volcanoes by their own labor and at their own expense. In high westerly winds it was manifest that the red tiles of the roof would be scattered in the air, to the great danger of the faithful worshippers. On a neighboring hill I perceived the National School, where, as I was informed later by our host, were taught Hebrew, English, French, and Danish, four languages of which, with shame I confess it, I don't know a single word. After an examination I should have to stand last of the forty scholars educated at this little college, and I should have been held unworthy to sleep along with them in one of those little double closets, where more delicate use would have died of suffocation the very first night. In three hours I had seen not only the town but its environs. The general aspect was wonderfully dull. No trees and scarcely any vegetation everywhere bare rocks, signs of volcanic action. The Icelandic huts are made of earth and turf, and the walls slope inward. They rather resemble roofs placed on the ground. But then these roofs are meadows of comparative fertility. Thanks to the internal heat, the grass grows in them to some degree of perfection. It is carefully mown in the hay season. If it were not, the horses would come to pasture on these green abodes. In my excursion I met but few people. On returning to the main street I found the greater part of the population busied in drying, salting, and putting on board codfish, their chief export. The men looked like robust but heavy blond Germans with pensive eyes, conscious of being far removed from their fellow creatures, poor exiles relegated to this land of ice, poor creatures who should have been Eskimo since nature had condemned them to live only just outside the arctic circle. In vain did I try to detect a smile upon their lips. Sometimes, by a spasmodic and involuntary contraction of the muscles they seemed to laugh, but they never smiled. Their costume consisted of a coarse jacket of black woolen cloth called in Scandinavian lands a vadmo, a hat with a very broad brim, trousers with a narrow edge of red, and a bit of leather rolled round the foot for shoes. The women looked as sad and as resigned as the men. Their faces were agreeable but expressionless, and they wore gowns and petticoats of dark vadmo. As maidens they wore over their braided hair a little knitted brown cap. When married they put around their heads a colored handkerchief, crowned with a peak of white linen. After a good walk I returned to Monsieur Fridrikson's house, where I found my uncle already in his host's company. End of chapter 9